Welcome to Foreign Countries, Conversations in Archaeology with me, Ash Lenton. The website is foreigncountries.podbean.com. If you're enjoying Foreign Countries and you think it's worth $2 a month just to keep it going, please become a patron of the show. Go to patron.podbean.com forward slash foreign countries. This time around, we're going to focus on one of my favourite subjects in Australian archaeology, and that's rock art. The days of the art historical approach to rock art are long gone. Modern interpretations of rock art are based on scientific techniques and cultural context. Later on, I'll be joined by Dr Sally May to talk about the more recent contact period of rock art. But first, I'm joined by Professor Joe MacDonald. Joe is the Director of the Centre for Rock Art Research and Management at the University of Western Australia. She holds the Rio Tinto Chair in Rock Art Studies. For many years, Joe has been working in the Pilbara and Dampier in the north of Western Australia. And today, we are talking about the Murujuga Project, investigating the world's largest rock art galleries. Joe, can we start with your background and how this particular project came about? So um, I basically came to WA in 2012. I I was a cultural heritage manager before that. And so my first engagement with rock art on the Dampier Archipelago is actually writing the scientific assessment for the National Heritage Listing. That was done in 2006. And then the National Heritage Place was declared in 2007. And then we also wrote, Peter Beth and I wrote a, a document actually arguing that it also reached outstanding universal values in 2011. And the Australian Heritage Council wrote a report basically arguing that it did meet, they thought, at least one outstanding universal value, which is what it has to do to get onto the World Heritage List. But two of the areas that they said they thought there was more information needed was actually demonstrating the age of the art, because we've been arguing right from the beginning. And Ken Mulvaney, obviously, in his PhD, argued that people started to create art when they first got there. And at that stage, it was thought to be about 20,000 years ago, because we had some dated shell from that time period. So age of the rock art was one thing, but also the the community values for the place for something which the Heritage Council was not convinced uh, they knew enough about. So when I came to WA, I was actually here doing a, a future fellowship, which was looking at Western Desert rock art and rock art in the Great Basin. But because I was the Rio Tinto chair as well, I felt the need to actually start a project which was looking at the Dampier Archipelago and answering some of these questions which the Heritage Council had identified as being wanting, potentially therefore holding up the nomination of that place to the World Heritage List. So we put in the application and the goal of that project, so Murujuga Dynamics of the Dreaming was the name of the project. It was a a linkage project with the partner being Rio Tinto and the collaborating organisation being Murujuga Aboriginal Corporation. And we got it and then we actually started the fieldwork in about 2015. And what were the aims of the project? And so the goal really very much was to document art in parts of the archipelago where we had no systematic record. Most of the rock art in the archipelago had at that stage been documented by cultural heritage surveys ahead of impacts. We have the largest gas processing plant in the southern hemisphere in this same landscape. And so a lot of the archaeology was done in the 80s prior to that LNG being constructed, the Woodside LNG. That was expanded in 2007 with Pluto B. And so there's a lot of rock art recorded as a result of areas being destroyed but when we did the initial nomination there was only one systematic survey that had been done across the northern part of the borough which is called the National Estate Grant Project uh, which was run by Peter Beth back in the early 90s. That was the only systematic record we had of rock art outside those areas which had already been destroyed by industry. So when we did the National Heritage Listing, we'd actually harvested legacy data, which had been collected from a whole range of different sources. So people just going out in boats, recording rock art that they'd seen around the islands or the NEGP survey or various other things. And then, of course, the field schools had also started. So we'd actually started documenting more. And also Ken Mulvaney had worked on, again, this legacy data for his PhD. So the aim of the project was to document rock art in areas where we had no systematic record and to actually do excavations of landscapes to try and contextualise that earliest rock art production. So in terms of methodology, how did you go about this new project? We very much focused on the outer islands because sea level rise basically created the archipelago about 7,000 years ago. And so the argument has always been that the art was documenting this big transition from an arid coastal plain in the deep past to the Holocene record of it being a maritime coast and people using those islands very differently. So the logic of looking on the outer islands was that these were the landscapes that in fact were reached first by the rising sea level and were therefore cut off first by the sea level continuing to rise. And in fact, we assumed that probably people stopped using those landscapes as intensively because they were cut off and we had no real record of people using marine craft before contact. 
So that was the predictive model that we would not find as much art necessarily and it would mostly be older on the, on the outer parts of the archipelago. And so we set about to do these systematic surveys in transects and excavating what we thought were geomorphically suitable locations to have actually retained the sort of early records that we thought might contain. So at the same time, there was a, another UWA project happening on Barrow Island, the Barrow Island Archaeological Project. That's a limestone region and they've got some really nice deep limestone caves with excellent preservation. And so by about 2016, which was when we started the project, they in fact had a 50,000-year-old sequence, which went up to 8,000 when in fact Barrow Island was cut off by the sea level rising and going past and continuing into its current coastline. So we had a, a proxy there of people living. This is only about 200 kilometres to the west of the Dampier Archipelago. So we have a proxy now of people living on that coastal plain for 50,000 years. And if our modelling is correct and our presumptions are correct, we actually think people were creating art for as long as they've been living there. And so the sequence therefore gets expanded back. But again, we still don't know what people were doing or how we can actually date the records. So our excavations proceeded and we did about 15 areas. We had planned to do open area excavation, but we got so much material from every square that we excavated that it was impossible to actually open it up. We were working on that material for the next 30 years if we'd actually opened up areas. It was a really, really rich record. Okay, so this is very much a collaborative project. How did you go about working with stakeholders? Okay, so the, the whole aim was to work in collaboration with the Mildjug Aboriginal Corporation. That's a fairly recently evolved corporation. It's actually a non-native title body. So when all the, the coastal Pilbara groups were going through their native title determinations, the state, in fact, imposed a state-based agreement called the Burrup Maitland Industry Agreement, which basically excluded native title from the Dampier Archipelago, but made all the coastal Pilbara groups the guardians for that place. And so the five language groups are part of that agreement. And so the Aboriginal community we're working with are from the neighbouring groups, but they all basically work together to manage Murujuga. Murujuga has also been considered to be orphan country. So there was a big massacre there in the 1860s, Flying Phone Massacre. And the general understanding had been that people really stopped using that landscape. It became a sorry place. And so it didn't have that same long-term connection that we have in other parts of the Pilbara where people were basically still, certainly well, in the desert anyway, they were living until the 1960s in a traditional lifestyle until contact. So in terms of working with people, it was very much about working with the rangers who are now managing that cultural and conservation landscape. They have been involved in the fieldwork. They certainly assisted in the logistics and getting us out to the island. It's obviously a fairly complex thing to have fieldwork in a landscape where there are absolutely no buildings, no roads. And so we'd be dropped on an island, we'd set up a camp, and then we'd basically walk all over the islands to do our work. So the systematic transects were set up to try to sample a range of the representative landscapes out there. So we're looking at what is now on the coast going into the inland interior of those islands. I mean, none of them are huge. Rosemary Island is five by four. Enderby is a bit longer. It's about eight and a half kilometres by four. So they're, they're not huge islands, but they're certainly big if you're walking across them. Um, they're covered in spinifex. They're covered in these big rocks. And so it's not a simple landscape to just set out your transects and, and walk. You basically, we actually had to be quite strategic about how we set that up. But we did basically identify a whole range of different landscapes and then set out to systematically cover those. So we had a team of archaeologists. We had some project personnel that were funded by the project. We also had Rio Tinto's heritage personnel come along, we had rangers when they were able to come, and we had volunteers as well. The normal team size would be between about six and ten people, and we'd be out on the island for about two weeks, and we'd basically focus in a particular area and systematic survey. One of the innovations of the project, I guess, was transforming our collection techniques to a fully digital collection process. So we started off about 20 years ago using nomads with ArcPad embedded forms on them. That's now evolved to using FileMaker and iPads, which also do drawing. This has actually meant in some ways it's a much quicker process to mobilise that data into a database. Of course, there's always the auditing and various other things that go on as well. We had one day where we lost an entire day's collection because the iPad just suddenly fritzed itself and that was it. So, you know, that identified a real issue in terms of how do you actually maintain your data integrity. But really, it, we managed to basically get these information curated pretty quickly and we're in the early new year, we'll be putting out a monograph, which is the rock art recordings and the excavations. Oh, right. So you were doing excavations as well? So the excavation process was a little bit more involved, obviously, because it takes more people to dig a site than it does to record a rock art panel. So again, we'd have teams of about 10 camp and we'd locate geomorphically suitable sort of landscape and, and excavate it. Most of our sites were basically targeted on what we could see in terms of a surface signature. 
So we're focusing on these earlier forms of nymphs, which is a terebralia, the mangrove shellfish uh, type of really focused, mainly sort of early Holocene signature on the islands. Um, but we also targeted a few really deep sand bodies because we thought these, in fact, might retain a Pleistocene record underneath the Holocene one. What we ended up doing was digging a huge amount of Holocene sand dune <laughs> to get down to often a very thin smear of this same early Holocene record that we were getting in the surface scarabrated middens. So we've basically replicated that same record in the deep sequences where we've had to move tons of sand and also in a, in a midden sequence where in a 50 by 50 we've actually excavated something like 30 kilograms of shells. So it was a fairly labour intensive and it really resulted in a huge amount of material which now two years since the project finished and we're still writing it up. So I think that gives you an idea of the scale of what we were trying to do is probably a little bit ambitious. But, you know, I think it's been fabulous in terms of actually really tying down that, that record which didn't exist before. And because the current coastline really has drowned everything before 7,000 years ago, that early Holocene record is missing from most of the rock shelters across the Pilbara. Oh, I see. So how do you go about dating the material? Yeah, most of the material we found. So we're talking about a cyclonic region. So every year they get this place gets pounded by at least two or three cyclones, mostly in the open. So again, you know, you're talking about a fairly lively taphonomic environment for things to be retained in. So we were using OSL in the sand bodies and we've dated shell where possible and we've also tried to do pair dating of the shell and charcoal where that occurred in middens. But it, Really what we've found is, is that preservation in those locations really is quite as bad as we thought it would be. And so none of our pairings have actually worked particularly well. One of the problems with terebralia is that it's one of those species which actually consumes limestone as part of its diet. So it's because it's a bottom feeder, it's actually picking up potentially much older carbon in its shell. And so we haven't managed to do the R factor, you know, the reservoir effect from those shells, partly because of the Montebello British bombing, which went on in, in the 50s, which has actually affected the bomb carbon, carbon has affected the live collection of species. And so we haven't managed to find any terebralia that we've collected prior to that. Because that's what you need to know. You need to actually know a live collection date and actually run the dating on that to be able to work out what the reservoir effect is. But based on work done elsewhere around Australia, and particularly uh, Fiona Petchy's work from New Guinea, that fact could be up to 600 years. So while we're getting dates of 10,000, that's probably not too bad. We have got some terebralia being used on the Burrup, which dates to the last 2,500 years, and that's obviously slightly more problematic in terms of our effect of about 600 years. But still, we don't think necessarily changing our understanding of what's actually going on. So basically, shell, where we've got it, very little carbon from the sand bodies. Now, you've started publishing new evidence. Could you share some of that with me? What we've now documented is an incredibly intensive occupation phase from about 15,000 years ago on the Outer Islands up to about 8,000 years ago. And then there's a change in the way people use that landscape once it becomes a set of islands. However, we've documented that they do continue to use the islands. And in fact, a lot of the evidence that we've got of those early contact encounters, so Philip Parker King came through in 1818. Uh, we know that William Dampier went past in 1699 and recorded the presence of people there. We know there were people there at contact. We've got the North American whalers who we've also got documenting interactions with Aboriginal people. And we have evidence of those encounters inscribed in the rock art as well. So really what the project has done is achieve the goals of trying to understand not necessarily the earliest rock art production there, because we still think that people were producing art there from as soon as they got to that landscape. We have now demonstrated that they were there during the, the last ice age. So during the LGM, uh, we actually have a rock shelter, one of the only rock shelters on the archipelago because it's mainly a scree slope, bulgary, blocky set of landscapes, not a, a place that's got rock shelters like the rest of the Pilbara or like Barrow Island. So we don't have that sort of repository of archaeological evidence to really retain that early record. But we have got evidence that people were there from the early Ice Age and then there was this incredibly, in increasingly intensive and complex use of that landscape from about 15,000 years ago and then right through up until contact. We haven't managed to date the earliest rock art still. That's actually a new project which we now have funding for. But really what we've done is identify the complexity of that late Pleistocene, early Holocene transition. And we have a much better idea now of how people actually use those landscapes in deep time because we can see that the rock art, which we had documented on the bar, is actually across the entire archipelago. Wherever you have the sorts of resource features that you'd expect people to be looking at in an inland desert, you actually have rock art being produced at those places. And then as the Holocene changes that landscape to a set of islands, we actually have a change also in the way that people are using it in those, those islands again. So is it sorted now? Is everything clear? Yeah, well, look, I think I think what we have just demonstrated is it's much more complex than you might have liked. <laughs> 
but that doesn't matter because it's actually significantly more interesting, I think, than, than even we had thought it was going to be. So I think really what we've managed to do is fill in that missing gap right at the beginning of the occupation of that period. So from 15,000 to about 8,000 is a period which is pretty well lacking in a lot of the coastal sites. We've demonstrated that we've actually got people creating habitations by about 8,000 years ago. So people on some of those sites are arranging themselves in domestic structures and actually separating their social space, which really indicates to us that people are in fact living much more intensively and closer together at a much earlier time than perhaps earlier models of intensification in Australia would have suggested. And it looks like it's an early Holocene rather than a late Holocene effect. Certainly in terms of understanding the age of the rock art, probably what we think now is that the most intensive period of rock art production probably is that Pleistocene transition, early Holocene, whereas Ken Mulvaney's model would have suggested that most of it was probably being produced in the late Holocene. But the other thing that we think we've discovered is in fact that probably in the most recent period, people were in fact creating less rock art. So for some reason, rock art has dropped out of that signalling repertoire in the most recent past, and we're not sure if that's being replaced with something else. Possibly material culture, wooden material culture with shields, with designs on them and portable objects. Certainly we've got a lot of symbolic behaviour that we're finding that we hadn't documented before, like beads. So one of the sites out on Enderby Island has got a dentalium bead manufacturing site right in the middle. So people have carried these little, little tusk shells at least three kilometres from the current beach. And certainly they are dated to about 1,200 years ago. So it is the current island morphology that people are using when they're bringing these things to that place. But we've also discovered in that site, and again, it's unfortunately really disturbed by being in the open. That's intensively occupied, obviously, in the late Holocene as well. Occupation there started at around 8,000 years ago, or 8 to 10,000 years ago. And then we have this incredibly intensive period, which finishes about the time Philip Parker King arrived on, on Rosemary, on the Enderby Island. And as well as these beads being manufactured, we actually have people bringing these tiny fish. So they, we think, that in fact, they're using nets or some sort of wooden objects to actually collect very, very small fish. So we've got otolith, about 150 otoliths from a fish that's about the size of a white bait right in the middle of the island. So there's either birds bringing a large number of those little things there, or in fact, we've got some actual practices. People are, in fact, using fishing equipment, which hasn't been documented particularly well anywhere in the museum collections. So another project which one of our chief investigators, Al Patterson, has been working on, which is called Collecting the West, has in fact documented a whole bunch of material that was collected from the coastal Pilbara in the early 1800s to mid to late 1800s, and that's distributed amongst museums in Europe. And it's got things like 30 metre long spinifex net that people are obviously using for fishing. And, and you know, that this is a record that isn't necessarily known. And we're actually finding a whole bunch of rock art of these grids, which we think may in fact be fishing nets. really does suggest people are using a whole range of technologies which aren't going to conserve in the archaeological record. So they're actually spinifex based and wooden artifact based material culture. And that the record is actually telling us a lot about that. And we can now interpret a lot of the art that we found in the recent past as being potentially these material culture items that, that we hadn't identified before. So the publications have started to come out in the last year or two. Where does that take the research next? One of the things that is coming out of that original project is obviously some more publications, which are the data from that we've collected. So we're actually getting a monograph together, which will be all the rock art data going through a cultural clearance process at the moment. So we're making sure that the imagery that is released is appropriate from the community's point of view. But it will have that data. It will have all the excavation material data. And obviously there'll be more synthesis papers that will come out after that. But we thought it was really important to get that data out there because it's something that is really unique on that coastal strip, but also important for filling in a gap in the Pilbara where a lot of the rock shelters have got a lot of the recent Holocene record and obviously a lot of that deeper time as well. But it's probably missing that middle section, as I said, that middle Pleistocene transition period. But one of the things we still haven't managed to resolve is when did people create the rock art? And I guess that's the thing which is still the burning question. So a new linkage project, which we're starting hopefully in the new year, it's, is a project which is specifically looking at dating desert varnish, which occurs on the rock art. It'll also be attempting luminescence dating of stone features. So Luke Bliganik, who's a specialist in that, will be working on actually trying to work out when stone features might have been created by using luminescence. Desert varnish, we're going to use for the first time uranium thorium as a potential dating mechanism because in the past people have tried to date desert varnish using mainly radiocarbon which because it does trap radiocarbon in it. But what we've discovered, what people working on desert varnish have discovered is that it's got these micro laminations in it which are potentially of different ages. So the idea is to try and use laser ablation and actually separate those layers and then look for the uranium thorium within those but also look for carbon still within those layers and try and date those layers separately. So that's work that's going to start in the new year. The other thing we're really interested in is um, a lot of the waterholes 
that still are spring-fed today, but many of them are not spring-fed because groundwater is in fact being cut off by sea level rise, have got these really large calcium carbonate crusts around them, so sometimes called tufas or various other things. And we think this is going to be an environmental record which we, have, we could also explore in terms of trap pollen, again dating, but also potentially looking at groundwater relatability across the Pilbara. So what is the relationship of the water coming up in these things? They're not all rain-related, they're groundwater-related springs. And so this material that actually is coming through the rock, coming up from under the ground, is actually creating these crusts at the, the interface between the water at the waterholes and invariably around these waterholes that have got these very large deposits. And they're up to two metres deep. We have no idea yet because we haven't tried to date them. We don't know what that record is actually looking at. But given that we've got speleotherms at Exmouth and on Barrow Island, which go back 125,000 years, it's potentially we're going to get a similar sort of record at the ground contact between these calcium carbonate collection points. And so we're going to explore that as well. So we've got a fairly broad, multidisciplinary team working on that, mainly scientists people who are looking at uranium thorium, obviously, and the people who are working on the team have actually done coral dating before and have actually managed to perfect uranium thorium for dating coral formations. If we can date desert varnish, then that's an amazing outcome for Australia because we have so much of our early art and is in fact covered by this desert varnish, which we haven't managed to date after a fairly unfortunate start, I guess, back in the 80s when in fact somebody tried to do it. They got some, some amazingly early dates, but they also got some extremely young dates from the same motif, which brought the whole technique into dispute and disrepute. <laughs> And I think it's because it has got these micro laminae in it. And so they were just basically collecting these samples, mashing them up and getting a homogenised dish. Might have been young, might have been old. So hopefully by changing our technique and actually refining it with some new uh, micro techniques which weren't available 20 years ago, we're going to really get some interesting results which will progress our knowledge of, that, of the, how old that art actually is. And who is the team? It's a broad-based team. Most of them are at UWA, but we're also working with Zenobia Jacobs at Wollongong, Janet Hurt at Melbourne University, who's a geochemist, Tanjao Lu at Columbia University, who's a an Amer- North American specialist in desert varnish. And so it's a broad-based team from that point of view. Luke Gliganik, who is now back in Australia, did a lot of his work on a cosmogenic dating of, he's actually done it on artefacts, but also stone features. He's done that in Mongolia set of scientists from around the world with specialties. We have got a pretty good skill set here at UWA and postdocs will, two of the three will be working at UWA. Well, I hope we can talk more about this as further publications come out. So thanks for joining me, Joe McDonald. I'll turn now to Dr. Sally May, Senior Research Fellow at the Place, Evolution and Rock Art Heritage Unit at Griffith University. Sally is an archaeologist and anthropologist and specialises in Indigenous Australian rock art and ethnographic museum collections. For as long as I can remember, Sally has been working in Arnhem Land with local communities, surveying and interpreting contact period rock art. With her colleagues, Sally has co-authored a significant volume of publications, and we're going to talk about a few of the very recent ones. Sally, can we start with contact period rock art? This is a very cross-disciplinary field, isn't it? So my research really focuses around the so-called contact period rock art. And uh, what that really means is rock art that reflects these kind of dramatic periods of cross-cultural interactions and so forth. And very often this rock art, not just in Australia, but around, around the world, is being referred to as kind of the, the more rubbish, the casual art that you find in recent times. And a lot of earlier researchers would make casual comments about this rock art not being traditional, if you like. So it was something that I became interested in very early on in my career because I could see that this contact period rock art really gave us insights into Aboriginal histories that we weren't getting in other ways. And so what we have with contact period rock art is really a first-hand account of these activities and interactions, new animals, new people, new material culture coming in that we're not really getting from other forms of archaeology in those early time periods. So we're getting first-hand Aboriginal accounts painted or engraved on rock that can tell us about these Aboriginal histories. And, of course, that tells us all sorts of interesting things about how people use objects, or in this case rock art, to manage or, if you like, mediate these sort of experiences. And so it has implications for a whole range of of archaeology. So a lot of my research, particularly in the last few years, has been about linking together the archaeology, the recording of these sites, with the anthropology that exists, doing new anthropology as well, and also linking it up with the histories. And what I was finding is that for Western Arnhem Land, where I do most of my research, the histories are really lacking. There there hasn't been enough interrogation of 
the historical records that do exist to allow us to really have a really good understanding of these early time periods. So everything from, you know, the early days of interaction with Macassans through to more recent, you know, church histories and so forth. So what we were finding, and I think this has happened to quite a few archaeologists in the past, including John Mulvaney, who ended up writing quite a lot of books based on history rather than archaeology, is that you need to fill these gaps somehow. So my recent book that I've written with Laura Rademacher from the Australian National University, Donna Najimarek, who's a traditional owner up around the Gumbalanya region in West Arnhem Land, and Julie Nandul Gumadul, who is one of the senior traditional owners for the community of Gumbalanya, or previously referred to as Owen Valley, is to bring together some records for a very specific time period. So our book, The Bible in Buffalo Country, tries to really bring the original records that we have in terms of the missionaries writing about what's going on in Owen Pelly at that time, together with Aboriginal responses to that time period as well, and to put it out there and to say, okay, well, here's some of this history. Let's talk about it. Let's engage more with what was happening at this time period. And what that does for our rock art studies is it gives us a reference point, something we can use to pull into our interpretations of the contact period rock art. So in terms of methodological approach, how does this new book fit in? So as I was, I was saying, uh, this book, The Bible and Buffalo Country, what it does is it really helps to kind of contextualise the rock art that's being made during this particular time period and earlier and later as well. It's all linked in. We're looking at Owen Pelly, now referred to as Gumbalanya, is a small Aboriginal community in Western Arnhem Land. It's just across the border from Kakadu National Park, right in the middle of Australia, right up top. Owen Pelly is Mengurji country, but around about 1900, 1910, a Scotsman named Paddy Kale set it up as a buffalo shooting camp and later on went on to develop all sorts of farming in the area as well. Buffalo had been a really key part of the contact period in this area. In about 1820s, you have buffalo being released from these settlements up on the Coburg Peninsula nearby, these failed early British settlements. They release these buffalo and they go wild. It's the tropics, they love it, they breed like mad, and you end up with buffaloes everywhere in the region. And therefore, they become a really major part of Aboriginal life in terms of cultural business, but also in terms of employment. And people end up working in these buffalo camps, skinning and salting buffalo, men, women, children, all working in these camps. It's a major part of Aboriginal life in the area. So Paddy Kale sets up this settlement. Uh, Ten years or so later, the Church Missionary Society takes it over. And that's where the book, The Bible in Buffalo Country, really takes up this history. It talks about that first missionary influence in the area, in an area that had been dominated by buffalo hunters, a real Wild West type scenario. But in terms of methodology, for us, well, for me in particular, this, this book was really a tool for looking more broadly at how people are using rock art in the area and helping us to really understand what we're seeing in some of these images and to interpret them. So if we understand what these missionaries are doing in the area, if we understand what the buffalo shooters are doing and how that's influencing Aboriginal life, we get a better understanding of, of this recent rock art as well. So what's remarkable about the rock art in Buffalo Country? One of the main features of the Owen Pelly or Gumbalanya community is that they have a series of hills nearby and one of these hills is called Inyalak and it's very famous for the sheer number and diversity of the rock art up on the hill. One of the images that's painted up there is being nicknamed the Buffaroo and we wrote a paper on this which is coming out in rock art research soon and it's about how this buffalo kangaroo mix it's a morphing image between imagery they knew how to paint kangaroos with uh, new animals that have come in that they weren't so familiar with. And so what you end up with is you end up with this kind of merged animal that's part buffalo and part kangaroo as well, hence the buffaroo. But this first sight depiction is what we're calling it. This is, you know, our interpretation is that this image is representing a very early attempt at depicting buffalo. But what, what it did is the research for this paper, when we were talking to traditional owners about it and visiting the site and talking about buffalo, word spread in the community that some people were interested in, in buffalo paintings. And everybody kept saying to us, oh, there's this site. You need to talk to Kenneth Mangaroo about Jarra because that's the buffalo site. And so there was this kind of community knowledge that there was a very important uh, site with lots of depictions of buffalo in Kenneth Mangaroo's country. And so we sat down with Kenneth and he was very keen to to go out and and have a look at this site and see what sort of condition it was in now. He hadn't been there for a very long time. The last time he'd been out there was with one of my colleagues, Professor Paul Taysom, many years earlier. And so we went back out to this particular site in order to, to document the whole site, really, and then to compare it with earlier photographs from the actual site. Okay, so what were your aims? What were you trying to achieve? So our idea behind revisiting these sites is 
multifaceted. So one of the key things we want to do is work with people to get back out on country, multiple generations visiting together, talking about the place, but at the same time, producing a record of the site that's going to help community members to, to manage it in, in an ongoing way. So to get a better idea of conservation, what sort of condition the site's in. So while we were out there, we did a full documentation of the, of the site. We weren't the first ones to, to go there by any means. And, and one of the things that I find most interesting is when you do have these sites that are visited by multiple researchers, in this case, multiple archaeologists over many, many years. So, you know, we had Fred McCarthy from the Australian Museum, obviously, 1965, he's out of the site. It has a different name, but we managed to work out it's the same site. 1965, he's out there. Carmel White was out there in 1967. She makes some important observations in terms of the contact period of rock art. One of them is that she says this site is significant because of its recent rock art. And I think certainly in 1967, that is not something other archaeologists were talking about. So she should be credited there with really understanding how important Jarung was all the way back in 1967. Robert Edwards visits in the 1970s. And then you've got George Lupka, the famous rock art researcher in the 1970s and 1980s. And then since then, you've got, you know, people visiting 1986. You've got Ben Gunn there in 1988. Tayson, as I mentioned before, and then Daryl Wesley as well in 2006. So we have this really rare photographic record of this site. In terms of rock art conservation, that's a real gold mine because you can really look at changes that are occurring at the site over a long period of time. And that's what we did. We went back and we compared and we used the old photographs to actually draw out the imagery that is no longer visible to the human eye. And that certainly my colleague Andrea Hallandoni from Griffith University she was able to do photogrammetry at the site, do 3D recordings of the site, and then use digital enhancement to bring out these images, including images of buffalo that really are not visible anymore. So by combining all these different methods, we were able to use the archaeology of the site and then compare it with the anthropology. And how do you use anthropology? How does Ark and Anth come together? With the buffalo research, it really inspired us to want to know more about the, how these new animals were being treated in rock art terms. So we wanted to look at the evidence that rock art played a role in mediating any experiences they might have and also mediating environmental but also societal changes as well. So Jarung, we knew from community telling us and from previous researchers that have been there, was a really key site for buffalo paintings. We knew that it was going to provide us with the opportunity to look at a number of paintings of buffalo and to really explore these ideas with more evidence, more data. So in terms of new data, it's the first detailed recording the site had had. And so that itself brought many, many new insights. It was also useful to have multiple people in the field at the same time discussing this. So we had traditional owner Kenneth Mangaroo with us. We had Paul Tayson, Daryl Wesley, Andrew Hallandoni, and we had Roxanne Zhang as well from Papua New Guinea. So we had all these eyes on the site discussing things in the field, and that really brought some interesting insights itself. I've already mentioned the, the new recordings that we made, bringing motifs that were no longer visible back to life so that we could actually look at them in detail and comparing the data as well. And what's the new evidence? What did you find? So what did we find? We found that there were six buffaloes painted at the site across four different panels. Life size, some included x-ray elements, and what I mean by that is it's traditional in the area to depict the internal organs of an animal. It's part of a very complex artistic system, and some of the buffalo it had this x-ray included. There was real dominance of the yellow pigment colour there. One of the buffaloes was painted without a head. Two of them are back-to-back, -back, and we noticed that obviously these are associated with an enormous array of other contact material culture, including, I think, from memory, about 18 firearms all sorts of saddle packs from horses. There are horses as well, depicted knives and so forth. So it's just part of this broader story. So putting it all together, how do you understand this rock art now? What Jarung gave us was the opportunity to use archaeology, existing anthropology for the site, and new interviews that we're doing, and then compare it with the history that we have as well. So a really comprehensive look at this. And clearly what we came up with was that these are not depictions of prey. These are not simple depictions of people celebrating the fact that they've you know, hunted a buffalo and have lots of meat to eat. But there is a lot more embedded in these paintings. And a lot of anthropologists over the years in Western Arnhem Land had noted important cultural aspects to do with buffalo. And that includes Ronald and Catherine Burnt, who I believe were the first ones to note that buffalo were part of the social kinship system in the area. They had matrimoiety, they had semi-matrimoiety, they had 
all sorts of affiliations that you would also give to humans and so forth. So they fitted into this social system. John Altman later on agreed and actually expanded this even more to show that there were two different types of buffalo and that some associated with short legs in the front and some had long legs and they were representing different aspects of the moiety system. He also noted, as did Luke Taylor, that buffalo had become associated with the rainbow serpent, Naliog, one of these big creator beings as well, and that there are, and there still are, made today, paintings of the rainbow serpent with buffalo horns, indicating Inanga, which is said to have been the father to buffaloes. There's also the fact that they've chosen yellow for a lot of these buffalo. This isn't just random. This is a choice people are making. Yellow relates to the Yurichur patrimoiety. So there were all sorts of insights from anthropology into what the artist might be communicating through these particular buffalo paintings. And the other really key point was that the anthropology also showed us that there were many mentions of elders saying that buffaloes weren't new. These weren't new animals. These aren't introduced animals. The buffalo has always been here. It's just re-emerging. And so I guess what we're really seeing with the Jarong buffaloes is a place where people are using the art to manage this re-emergence of this really important creature back into their lives as well. So we really, we had all these insights. You know, the archaeology showed us things in the rock art that was no longer visible. We could compare and and measure and analyse. The anthropology gave us all these insights into how buffaloes are so much more important than simply being prey, that they actually were embedded in a cultural system, that they weren't new, they were re-emerging, and that rock art was playing a role in this in the contact period. So what can you say about the management of these reintroduced buffalo? And how was the rock art used in the community? It's a good question. Catherine Freeman and I have published before on how contact period rock art is a tool for helping people to navigate experiences during the contact period. And I think the buffaloes that we're talking about are just a one more case study in which we can see how this is happening. So we can see that these life-size depictions of buffalo, if you can imagine they're being painted, likely being painted with other people around, stories are being communicated, traditional stories are being shared, new ones are developing. This is really a tool that people are using to probably not only talk about the fact this is a re-emergence, but also to talk about the fact that this is how you manage this animal. Whether it's dangerous, which buffalo were, they were a dangerous animal to hunt, especially when in these early days, obviously, Aboriginal people are hunting with spears. Later on, they're using firearms, obviously, in the buffalo camps. So you probably also got all these kind of tools for managing this. Now, if you can get a buffalo for your community, that's very significant because of the meat distribution. This is a meat that will keep for a while and it will feed a very large group. So it would have quickly become a very sought-after resource in the area as well. So being able to very quickly integrate that into a cultural system so that you manage that, it would have been a really interesting time period to witness what was going on with that. I should say, however, that one of the other things that John Altman noted was that the buffalo weren't part of food taboos in the area. Now, most foods in the area are associated with certain people at certain times can eat foods and and other times you can't much more complicated than that that that's the basics that there are taboos on certain foods for certain people at certain times or sometimes for life and buffalo was said not to have been integrated into that system and when the elders were asked about it they said oh it's too big it's too big so that kind of goes against this idea that they were integrated very much so into the cultural belief systems but not so much into the food taboos not something i can explain but it's an interesting aspect of their of their history i think but um, people still wanted to be able to eat these. Um, they didn't really know how to how to control that that side of things, perhaps. Are the buffalo still there? Buffalo continue to play an important role in Aboriginal life in Western Arnhem Land. So these are animals that people continue to hunt at outstations in particular. Buffalo meat is highly prized and looked after. The buffalo are really cool. What comes next? So in terms of the, the ongoing and future research in the area, so one of the key things we were trying to do, obviously, is to give um, traditional owners like Kenneth and Mangaroo a really good documentation of the site to be able to continue monitoring the site. And he works with some um, ranger groups as well. So that sort of data will be fed back into these management programs. And they can go back in another year, have another look at the site and see if things are changing, if actions need to take place. So there's, there's this whole other rock art conservation aspect to the research as well, which I haven't really talked about today, but it's a it's a major part of what we're doing. In terms of other research and broader uh, research going on in the area, obviously this a lot of people have said to us since we've started looking at buffalo and other people, I mean traditional owners, 
have said to us, what about all these other animals? You know, what about goats and pigs and dogs and uh, horses? And what are you going to look at them? And again, people will call or, or find us when we're in the community and say, hey, I've got this great site of my country. It's got all these horses painted. Come out, please, and document and, you know, let's go there. It's an ever-evolving, ever-emerging research program, really, if you like, in the area. It's what they're interested in in talking about. It's what they're interested in sharing and, and writing about as well because it's collaborative research. So more on the re-emergence of these animals, really, and, and trying to get a better uh, idea of exactly how people managed these new animals coming into their societies, this human-animal relationship that would have had a, a major impact. Horses would have had a really significant impact on Aboriginal life in the area and we know very little about first-hand accounts of Indigenous attitudes towards them, but they did paint them, you know, and like with the buffalo, I'm sure there are insights into their attitudes towards their treatment of and their understanding of horses that we're going to get from the rock art that we can't really get from other sources. So we'll continue down that path. Uh, we have a new Australian Research Council funded project, Art at a Crossroads, which is focusing on the neighbouring area of, around Awanbana, which is the Mount Borodale region as well. And in that, we're really interested in taking it again, another step, which is to look at not just subject matter in contact rock art that is clearly from the contact period in terms of horses and ships and guns, but actually imagery that's continuing to be painted that you might say is more traditional or you might say it it develops new but it's not obviously contact period rock art so because it doesn't include introduced subjects. So at Awanbana we really want to look at this recent rock art that isn't introduced subject matter and just see how people are using these other forms of rock art and developing new styles and um, what that might be telling us about inter-clan interactions during the contact period as well. So, look, in essence, what, what we're talking about here is a really complex form of archaeology, which incorporates other disciplines into the interpretation, and I think hopefully emphasises how significant this particular assemblage is for archaeological studies and for better understanding Aboriginal histories and, and archaeology across Australia as well. So this is part of a broader story. People across Australia are looking at recent rock art, and we can really start to build up this, this broader story of the archaeology of Australia through, through this contact period rock art. Thank you, Sally. Come back another time, will you? And thanks again, Joe McDonald. There's a reading list on the website and links to all of these projects. Join me next time for another conversation. Mm -hmm.